Good evening, everyone, or good morning, if you may be in a morning zone, or a good middle of the night, if you're in a middle of the night zone. Uh, welcome to our School of Public Health and Preventive Medicine um, showcase and uh, explanation of our postgraduate courses in Master of Health Data Analytics, Master of Biostatistics, Master of Forensic Medicine, and Master of Occupational Environmental Health. And we're very excited uh, to have the opportunity to tell you about uh, all of these courses. Uh, with us here today, we have uh, Xu Yin Chong from the Faculty of Medicine, Kirsten Marks, who's the prom Promotions Manager at uh, School of Public Health and Pre Preventive Medicine, our postgrad uh, wonderful administrators, Maida O'Keefe and Maria, and uh, from our academics, we have Dr. Joanna Dipnall, uh, Professor Karen Walker-Bone, a student in the Occupational Environmental Health course, Louise Edwards, Professor Richard Bassett, who's the head of the Master of Forensic Medicine, and Dr. Janine Rouse, who's a, a um, just recent uh, graduate from the Masters of Forensic Medicine. So there are the introductions, and if others want to sort of turn your camera for a moment, wave hello. You'll see all of them as the uh, as the evening progresses. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians on the lands on which we meet today, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. And I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. So I'm going to kick off with a very brief. Um, presentation about the School of Public Health and Preventive Medicine. So um, the School of Public Health and Preventive Medicine is one of the Asian region's largest public health schools. We're spread across a number of campuses. We have over 1,200 staff in our school, so we're a very large school. We teach to over 2,000 undergraduate students. And relevant to you, we have over 800 postgraduate students across a range of courses that you'll see some of those courses tonight. In terms of research, we are very active in research with over 800 publications per year and a huge amount of $75 million in research funding just in 2021 alone. And we're a leader in, uh, in a lot of areas of clinical research, including clinical quality, quality registries, and we're involved in some major clinical trials and also some innovative trial designs. Um, this graphic here shows the different areas that are, that are spanned within the School of Public Health and Preventive Medicine from population health studies, public health genomics, workplace and environmental health, got a very strong climate change program. I won't go all through all of those here, but it's a diverse, um, it's a very diverse school in terms of our activities. Uh, excuse me. Um, our location here is uh, you see a map here with our, our red marker here is approximately where we are. We're at the Alfred Hospital. Our main home base is the Alfred Hospital uh, campus of Monash University. With, uh, and, that, um, and that campus houses the, the very well known um, set of research institutes at the Alfred Precinct, including the Monash University, Alfred Hospital, a, real, a powerhouse in clinical research, the Baker Institute doing a lot of cardiovascular and diabetes research, and the Burnett Institute doing a lot of um, uh, infectious disease research and uh, international health research. So um, our home base is in a very research active area. So why should you come and start study at Monash? Um, all our courses are taught by world-class academics and clinicians. Um, we have a cutting edge research and practice environment. Our programs cater for busy professionals by um, most courses have sort of flexible offerings rather than being fully face-to-face -face environment. And um, this enables a work life or a study life balance by not having to come to class every single day from nine to five. We, we believe we have a very collegial atmosphere and uh, we have a lot of opportunities to conduct research projects 
as part of the various uh, courses you might be in. So that's a very brief snapshot of our school. I hope I have kept the time. So now we'll go straight to the first of our courses. And this is going to be the Master of Health Data Analytics. And the course coordinator is Dr. Joanna Dipnell. Oh, I'm sorry. Just before we do that, um, we'd like you to complete just a very quick uh, poll so we, we can learn something a little bit about you. This is an anonymous poll, just wanting some very simple um, some uh, characteristics about yourself. So if you could all please complete this poll, if you wish. And we'll just allow about a minute or so to do that. Sure, you just close the poll whenever you feel necessary, then I'll hand over to uh, Joanna. Oh, sure. All right, on to you, Joanna. Well, welcome everybody. Um, and I'm gonna to talk to you about the Master of Health Data Analytics course. Uh, a very exciting course uh, that is jointly coordinated by myself. That's a picture of me right there. And um, Professor Andrew Forbes, who you've just met. So let me just get my mouse working. Right, first I'm gonna set the stage about health data analytics. So let's think about the health data analytics market. Okay, a report by Grandview Research predicts the global healthcare analytics market size will reach $167 billion US by 2030. It will be expanding at a compound annual growth rate of 21.5% from this year, 2022, to 2030. Seek predicts that employment opportunities for data analysts in Australia will grow by around 28% in the next five years, ranking it as one of the nation's most promising employment markets. And please excuse my dogs barking on cue, so I'm sorry about that. So there's a tsunami of health data coming uh, our way over the next few years. And there needs to be health data analysts to meet these demands. So what is health data analytics? Well, the healthcare industry looks to data analysts to do such things as um, analyzing, gathering and analyzing data, um, helping healthcare professionals to accurately diagnose patients, to provide the most effective treatments, and also to doing activities like developing data behind those really interactive management tools, those dashboards you start to see on the internet related to health. The health analytics industry really uh, attained significant growth during the, the last pandemic. I say last because we've just changed over or everything's supposed to be normal now. And so the COVID-19 has seen big data take on a pivotal role in healthcare and data analysts were helping healthcare organisations and government um, predict the spread and impact of diseases. And healthcare has long been one of the industries that most frequently hires data analysts. And it remains, as I said, a promising industry to launch your career. So where are you needed if you're a health uh, data analyst? Well, you're needed in private health funds, uh, hospital service areas where they're analysing data, uh, pharmaceutical organisations, it's quite varied. Um, state, federal, government, healthcare departments, academia, and private enterprises that might be doing, um, developing some of those software apps. Way back in January 2018, the McKenzie Global Institute stated that workers will need to acquire new skills as machines increasingly, increasingly complement human labour in the workplace, we will need to adjust and reap the benefits, right? 
So this is a graph from that report, and it's about artificial intelligence and the potential to create value across sectors. And um, you can see the AI impact and healthcare systems and services up the top, up near the top. And if we look at the impact on total impact derived from analytics, it's sitting in there with banking and media and entertainment and aerospace and, space and defence. Now, Salary Explorer is a salary comparison and a careers resources website for employees and employers. They get the data from users, agencies, companies and employers, and they use an algorithm uh, to make sure that their figures are not exaggerated. They found that when the education level is a bachelor's degree for a healthcare data analyst, the average salary in Australia is around 70,000, 70, 000, 70 Point eight thousand uh, Australian dollars per year, but if you get a master's degree, that increases fifty three percent to one hundred and eight thousand Australian dollars per year. So this master's course gives you a great opportunity, an opportunity to acquire skill, skills for the future, for your job, and job and financial security. That's my take. <laughs> So the need for health data analysts is real and growing day by day. The skills you require in this master's course at Monash will equip you for the future work. You'll get advanced expertise in that knowledge and skills in foundation units. And those units cover health and data systems. They cover programming and machine learning, um, biostatistics, data wrangling, that's, you know, manipulating data and epidemiology. You'll gain expertise and competence in the key aspects of health data analytics. For example, things like programming in Python. Python is a software language that data scientists use on their day-to-day -day basis. You'll also get the expertise and competence in statistical inference and regression modeling. You have the opportunity to specialise in this course in either biostatistics, machine learning or a general stream. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So Monash has recognised this emerging need to upskill graduates with this innovative Master of Health Data Analytics course. It's suitable for undergraduates who have recently um, completed um, their degrees in health related degrees, maths, statistics degrees, uh, computer science, IT degrees. It's also suitable for researchers and practitioners if they want to upskill themselves quantitatively or change their direction professionally towards health data analytics. It's also um, suitable for data scientists that want to go down that, that pathway in the health domain. So just quickly, um, it's uh, on campus at two campuses so you, you get the experience of the Alfred as well as the Clayton campus because you do some work in the faculty of IT and you can uh, work do it full-time or part-time and we start next year in February. The first semester they're the core units I'm not going to go through them all but essentially you get an intro to health data in analytics that sets the foundation you get some programming uh, from the faculty of IT um, you get some introduction to epidemiology, some statistical analysis, um, regression, and data wrangling. The second year, um, you start to work out your electives, and you can also do, um, there are some other um, core subjects, but there's also one subject here, which is a, um, a data analytics practical project, and you either do it uh, one with a researcher or in a small team. So just, I'm not going to go through all of these electives, but if these are the streams and you can see with advanced biostats, you could do things like bioinformatics, health service uh, surveys, um, applied forecasting, you can do machine learning, you could do natural language processing, which is very exciting and deep learning. And you've got the communication, the two communication electives there. And uh, just um, to... Uh, almost finished off. Um, just reminding you that um, remember that this will, you know, already set you above the bachelor's degree. And what sort of things will you do? Um, 
Well, the variety of work depends on the company requirements. You know, somebody said, what do you, what's a day in the life of a data analyst in health analytics? And it really depends on where you are. So you could be monitoring health, public health data. You could be running data analytics models. You could be analysing electronic health records. You could be designing the data behind those interactive dashboards. And I today I just picked up a few, I went to Seek and I had a look at where you'd um, sort of the, the titles. So, it, you know, you can go to different states. There's one in um, data analyst, data and sorry, the data integration analyst in digital health. Um, and that one's in um, SA Health and then eHealth in Chatswood. There's um, a data scientist for the Ch Children's Medical Research Institute, Bupa, the insurance, health insurance. Um, and there's one Victoria Department of Health in um, advanced analytics. So when you finish this um, exciting master's uh, degree, you would have obtained highly sought after skills. There's no doubt about that. Uh, you'll have a relevant postgraduate qualification in all those areas, public health stats, data analytics, epidemiology. You'll have the skills of advanced conceptual and uh, analytical skills with uh, research and statistical methodologies background. You'll have experience in analysis and interpretation of health data. And you'll have your skills of R and Python. They're the software packages that the course uses. And you'll have writing and communication skills. So that's it. Um, I put your questions in um, chat and I look forward to answering them. Thank you. Thanks, Joanna. We will now invite Andrew to speak for biostatistics. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to talk now about the Master of Biostatistics. And as you'll see, it's quite closely related to health data analytics, but they differ in some quite important ways that I'll be coming to as I, uh, as I go through it. So firstly, what is biostatistics? So biostatistics is the scientific discipline of designing studies in health and the analysis and interpretation of health data. So here is one key difference with the health data analytics course. So biostatistics is much more involved in the designing and the data collection or what data is collected. Whereas health analytics is much more dealing with essentially big data, data big data that has already been collected. So biostatistics could be thought of as a uh, much uh, starting much earlier in the data collection phase. So it's, it covers a wide range of roles, particularly starting with designing of research studies so that um, research questions you might be interested in, they can actually be addressed. They can't be addressed if you don't collect the right data, no matter how much data you have. So you can have big data, but if the big data can't address the question, it's not really of any use. And similar to the health data analytics, it involves summarizing, analyzing, interpreting data using both conventional statistical methods and also modern machine learning methods according to what's needed. So biostatistics is about um, is design studies about health that leads to the collection or the availability of data about health and then ultimately to translate that data about health into knowledge about health. So why study biostatistics? So similar to health data analytics, the graduate diploma and the master of biostatistics is suitable for recent undergraduates who now want to commence a career as a professional biostatistician in either academia, industry or government. So um, this is suitable for um, graduates of health related degrees or of a quantitative math stats background. Also, it's very useful for health researchers um, or clinical practitioners wanting to enhance their quantitative skills to up their own research, research methodology capability or change a whole career direction um, 
into the biostatistician area. And uh, there's a, a long history of students completing the Master of Biostatistics and progressing on to PhD in biostatistics. So the Master of Biostatistics at Monash is part of a national collaboration called the Biostatistics Collaboration of Australia. And the Master of Biostatistics course is a fully online course that's delivered by um, it's shared delivery between the partner universities in this collaboration. So there are leading experts in biostatistics at each university and they're involved in the delivery of the course. And, but by being enrolled at Monash University, you do the practical project at Monash University. But otherwise the course is largely the same anywhere you do it across Australia because it's a collaborative course. And I've got listed there the universities that are involved in this collaboration. So how does this operate? This is a fully online course. It can be studied part-time or full-time, but I need to say here, it's on my last slide as well. I know there are many international students uh, on, uh, on this Zoom session. Because it's a fully online course, that means international students uh, cannot study this course in Australia because there needs to be a high percentage of the course that is face to face and this course does not meet with that. It does mean though that you can study in this course from your home country. So um, for students, um, for students who are eligible for this course, it can be studied either part time or full time, either one and a half years uh, full time or three years part time up to a maximum of five years for the program. So how does it work in the consortium environment? Students enroll at one of the universities in the consortium, but all students receive the same program no matter where you're enrolled. And uh, the units are delivered by the staff from one of the member universities. The course has got a very tight oversight by uh, government and industry representatives. And it was established over 20 years ago now, and there are major updates to the curriculum every four years. As Joanna said, the, the whole world of analytics and biostatistics is changing rapidly. So the course really changes in accordance with that. It has professional accreditation. So a graduate with either the graduate diploma or the masters is eligible for the accreditation as a graduate statistician by the Statistical Society of Australia. And the course won, the collaborative course won an award in 2019, the Statistical Society President's Award for Leadership in Statistics. So it's an extremely well-regarded course all across the country and Monash is one of the uh, leading members of that. So the course structure, it's 12 units. So 12 units rather than 16 units in the health data analytics. There are seven compulsory units, five elective units. Three of those compulsory units overlap um, with the health data analytics. So health data analytics and biostatistics do really have a common core. There's so seven compulsory units listed here, and then a whole range of elective units in various areas of biostatistics. So the career outcomes here, um, it can either be in health services research or in the health services delivery or in health related research areas, could be um, positions in research institutions doing health and epidemiological research. Uh, lots of graduates had ended up in the pharmaceutical health insurance industries or working for consulting firms. A number of graduates have ended up as hospital statistical consultants, either in a a public hospital or private hospital um, working collaborative, collaboratively with a very wide range of clinical researchers at those hospitals. Graduates have ended up in government departments and agencies and lots also in have moved on to academia. As I mentioned, uh, many graduates have either continued on to a PhD in biostatistics or used their skills to enhance their own research career. I'll just do a a few comments from a recent graduate 
This is uh, Dr. Taya Collier. So she did her master's in biostatistics a few years ago. She's on maternity leave at the moment. So she submitted some comments, written comments. Um, her current position is a statistical consultant at Peninsula Health. So about the Master of Biostatistics course, I found it extremely engaging and rewarding. The teaching staff are great. I still use my course notes in my day-to-day -day work because they're better than most textbooks. I also review old assignments because they closely mirror real world work. So the, the idea of this Masters of Biostatistics course, it's not just theory there, it's really uh, guided to mirror real work of practicing biostatisticians. As a career, as a biostatistician, also from Taya, offers quite diverse opportunities from methodological work, which is really quite independent, doing some statistical research work, to statistical consulting, which is very social, working with, working with a variety of people. So biostatisticians who can communicate are really sought after, and we uh, really focus on communication skills as part of the course. You need to have relevant strengths, but they need to not be on the purely maths side. So you don't need to have a purely maths background to be able to work, work successfully as a biostatistician. But her, her prize comment is, no matter what you choose within biostatistics, you'll always feel useful and valued because everyone wants a piece of you. And biostatisticians essentially all around the world are very much in high demand. And as Joanna said about health data analytics, there aren't enough biostatistician and health data analysts to meet the demand. And it's also a great career choice with women because being in so much demand, there is the great potential for part-time positions. Okay, now my closing slide here is comparing biostatistics with health data analytics. So, so biostatistics, as I mentioned, is fully online. So that means we can't have international students located in Australia to do the study. But the health data analytics has a mixture of online and in-person um, enrollments and international students are certainly very welcomed and perfectly allowable to study health data analytics onshore in Australia. So that's a major difference there. The biostatistics course is 12 units, really focusing in biostatistics. Health data analytics is a little broader and has four more units. So two years full-time versus 1.5 years part-time. Um, they both teach important software. Biostatistics has more emphasis on foundational, um, the foundations of methods, why the methods work and uh, very much um, really understanding how they work. Whereas the health data analytics sort of a broad statement has greater focus on computations and dealing with uh, large data sets. So that's all I want to present from biostatistics. And of course, please put your questions in chat and we're very happy to answer questions uh, when we have our Q and A session towards the end. So thank you very much. Thanks, Andrew. Um, and on to you now, Richard and Janine. I'll just share my screen and we'll be away. How's that working, folks? Perfect. Good. Perfect. Good. Thank you. So welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Richard Bass and I'm head of the Department of Forensic Medicine. I'm also Deputy Director of the Victorian Institute of Forensic Medicine, where is the, which is the place where all of the uh, death investigation is conducted for the state of Victoria. Um, can you slide? Go forward. Thank you. So this is where I work. So our institute has established well over 30 years ago. We do probably 7,000 medical legal death investigations every year. And we also have a very strong clinical forensic medicine department that examines the living victims of assault and sexual abuse, et cetera, et cetera. So we see our institute not really as simply determining the cause of death of an individual person, but as a way to use that data and that information to assist the living and assist people in 
avoiding death, and preventing violence being done upon them, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a fairly large institute. We are hire about 250 people in our building and attached to that very closely and sort of ingrained within the whole uh, fabric of the building is the Department of Forensic Medicine. So what is really forensic medicine? So it's basically medicine and science with a twist. So you've got to be able to apply your findings to the needs of the courts or to law in general. So you really need to have quite a bit of understanding of medicine and science, medicine and or science, but also an understanding of legal practice. And that's where this Master of Forensic Medicine comes in. So the course is a 72 credit point uh, professional masters. It runs over generally a three year period, maximum of five years, and it's 12 six point six credit point units that need to be completed over the duration of the course. And we have run it generally as a mixed teaching mode. So most of the, the majority of the work is online via assignments, Zoom meetings, uh, engagement with Moodle, et cetera. But uh, we have a two day face to face block teaching session for each unit. Of course, over COVID, that's been fairly restricted and we've managed to learn how to do some hybrid face to face meetings and online face to face meetings. And they've worked out very well over the period of COVID. So we're adapting just the same as everyone else is. And the course that we run has the Master of Forensic Medicine has three major streams. So it has a clinical forensic medicine stream, which is reserved for medical practitioners who wish to work in the field of forensic medicine, examining living victims of abuse and assault. We have a forensic dental stream, which is involved essentially with teaching dentists how to apply themselves to issues of dentistry as related to the law and particularly in identification of deceased victims and working in mass fatality uh, incident investigations. And we have forensic medical science, which is for the science students and involves teaching science, teaching these uh, professionals about the law and about forensic science and preparing them for a potential career in forensic science laboratories, police forensic labs, medical forensic labs um, once they graduate. So this particular master's degree, uh, it's the only one in the Southern Hemisphere, and there's not really one like it anywhere in the world where you've got, you're working in a forensic institute, a working forensic institute associated with a university, and everyone who teaches in this course is a practicing forensic medical or forensic science practitioner. So you benefit from real life, up-to-date current experience, and you have the opportunity to immerse yourself in a forensic institute um, as time goes on and as COVID recedes and we all get back to our normal lives. So the three streams are there. So clinical forensic medicine, forensic odontology, medical, forensic medical science, and next year we'll be starting a graduate certificate in forensic nursing. So for nurses out there who are interested in becoming forensic nurses, um, that will also be on offer. And this course mixes all these groups of students together. So the doctors get to know the dentists, get to know the scientists, and they learn a little bit about each other's business. And that's also the good when you're working in a forensic um, institution later on, you can understand what other disciplines are doing. So it kind of breaks down the silos in terms of forensic practice. As an example of the units that are required, so I've put the forensic medical forensic medical science core structure up on the screen there. And you can see that there's three core units, part A, everyone does that, all the doctors, dentists, and the scientists, medical evidence, ethics, medicine, the law, and elements of forensic science. And that gives you a real basis of the law, how doctors should react in a court of law, and all of the different branches of forensic science and the medicine that um, you may come across in your future career. And then there's a whole heap of electives. So each stream has a series of compulsory electives and then there's elective electives. So you get enough uh, units to complete your course. And for the forensic uh, medical science uh, students, they have the opportunity of choosing from these, these electives and that's not a complete list because we're adding new units all the time. But forensic medical science students must do toxicology, death investigation, elements of forensic pathology. 
and then they can choose from anthropology, odontology, pharmacology, quality management, forensic imaging, and we also have a research project, a six credit point research project that goes for a semester. And the aim of that research project is for you to conduct a small piece of research or a literature review that ends up in a publication in a journal. And of course, there's other units offered across Monash. Um, I'm pretty sure we'll be allowing students to take some units in the Masters of Data Analytics and also other um, courses across uh, Monash Medicine, Nursing and Health Science. Um, so clinical forensic medicine people who do this degree, this degree has been going to the doctors for probably 25 years, I think. And just about everyone who works at the clinical forensic medicine doctor is doing or has done its master's degree. And um, it's just going on in leaps and bounds. Graduates of the science stream, which is a newer stream, it's been going for maybe five years, but these people are getting jobs in, in mortuaries, in toxicology labs, uh, histopathology labs in the world of forensic medicine. And when it comes to our um, grad cert in forensic nursing, which starts next year, we've got a real shortage of trained forensic nurses in the state of Victoria and around, around Australia. So we're hoping to remedy that by running a course such as this. Now, um, I've got one of my past students that I've dragged out of the cupboard for this evening, um, Dr. Janine Rouse. Janine was a general practitioner. Now she's a clinical forensic medicine specialist who completed the master's, I don't know, a year ago or so, Janine? Yeah, about that, correctly. Yeah. And Janine now works for us at the Victorian Institute of Forensic Medicine as a clinical forensic medicine uh, consultant. And she'd like to just tell you a bit about her story and what she thinks of it all. Yeah, so um, yeah, I, I completed my uh, master's of forensic medicine, I think it was the year before last. Um, I, I was a medical doctor prior to that and starting the master's, the, it was actually the first subject in the master's, it was an ethics subject and that was my light bulb moment that this is um, the career I simply must have. Um, so I was really impressed with the, the quality of the teaching. And as Richard said, all of the, um, the lecturers are experts in their field. And it's a sort of field where there aren't really many textbooks because things do change rapidly. Um, so having um, you know, lecturers being so closely um, engaged with, with lecturers that are experts in their field, I think was one of the, the greatest strengths of the, the course. Um, I, I think also the, the connections made, again, not being a huge um, discipline, um, the face-to-face the -face component of the course allowed you to really connect with um, other people from around Australia and around the world who are working in the field of, of forensic medicine, whether scientific or clinical. Um, so that was a, a wonderful thing and the relationships from that have, um, have sort of lasted and allowed um, you know, some, some collaboration downstream. Um, I think the greatest feature of the, the course, having done sort of you know, other postgraduate studies, was how relevant um, the assessment tasks were to real life as a um, working in forensic medicine. So, for example, there were, there were no assignments you know, for, for the sake of assessment, it seemed. It was, um, for example, the you know, expert evidence course, the assessment was actually delivering evidence in a mock court scenario um, as is you know a, a core part of my role now um, and um, for many of the other subjects the assessment was writing um, court reports in the, the structure that you would do for a court which again is um, my bread and butter of my, my duties now so I found that the masters really prepared me for work in, in clinical forensic medicine um, and then it also led to further opportunities in in research I did take the research um, opportunity in the course and then that's now led downstream to a PhD in um, working starting a PhD in, in sexual assault in dating app sexual assault so that's something that I wouldn't have um, wouldn't have, have done if not for having started it within the, the master's program so yes thanks Janine <laughs> lovely lovely as always so you can see there's quite a in the medical stream there's quite a lot of opportunity and especially for research so we run a stream of um we do work into graded learning placements through monash university um we've got a pretty healthy research team going and we've got lots of research going including in machine learning looking at uh, post-mortem ct scans and other forensic imaging 
and seeing what we can do with that in AI and machine learning. So we have a pretty healthy honours students. We generally have five or six honours students every year. We have masters by research students and we have lots of PhD projects. So um, there's quite a bit going on in our department and it's quite an interesting place to be involved. But um, thank you very much and sayonara. Thanks, Richard and Janine. Um, so we will end the night with a brief presentation from Karen and Luis before we head on to question time. On to you, Karen. Thank you, Xu Yi, and thank you everyone who's gone before me. And good evening or hello for everybody who's listening. I will just do my very best to share my screen. And can you see that all right? Xu Yi? Uh, yes, uh, maybe just go to the slideshow. Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. So I'm thrilled to be introducing you to Louise Edwards, who's a current student in our course, who will also be able to talk much more authoritatively about things in the next few minutes. But just a brief introduction to what occupational and environmental medicine actually are. As you can see in these three pictures, the world of work keeps changing very rapidly and making marked impacts on how we work and what the conditions we work under are like. And generally speaking, in occupational environmental medicine, we are importantly concerned with whether work is... is... Sorry? Sorry, the door's opened. No problem. We're importantly worried about keeping people safe when they're at work. Work can be a dangerous place. And one of the main responsibilities of occupational environmental health is to keep it as safe as possible. However, some of the harms are much more environmental and not so obvious and physical. Things like biological agents like COVID for healthcare workers, asbestos and heat for when people are working dealing with fires or other external work like construction. There are other kinds of harm to health that come from work, which are much more subtle and which people don't traditionally think of. And that's mental health effects. Things like occupational stress is a marked cause of ill health and an important thing that we look to prevent in this discipline. So our aim as occupational and environmental medicine specialists is to create work that is healthy and safe for all. And that involves a whole load of things, including evaluating the risks, preventing the harms, designing our work so we maximize safety. And if we can't do that, mitigate the risks as far as possible. But not just that, after sleeping, the thing you do next most of in your whole life is working. So it's a very important opportunity to look after you and to look after your public health message. Things like diet and exercise, physical hazards, psychosocial hazards, and biological and chemical hazards. So the OEM course is an integrated and very research-led course. The, the Monash Center for Occupational and Environmental Health, I can, I can say this, that it's world leading because I only joined it nine months ago, so I can't take any responsibility whatsoever, but I did come from the other side of the world to join it because I knew of its reputation. Our course is multimodal, it's online, but the, it's in-person block days for each unit, which are compulsory attendance. Really importantly, our students are people, they're not numbers, and we want to look after you as individuals. We have the most amazing multidisciplinary community of students, including healthcare professionals, safety professionals, and environmental health specialists. And that interaction of each other is a very powerful component of this course. We also have fabulous links with industries, and we have partners who can enable worksite visits and practical sessions. We can provide things like interactive seminars with Australia's leading occupational health and safety practitioners and researchers. And we can provide a multiplicity of research opportunities for people. So just as a few examples, the sorts of things that we're interested in are older workers. How do we keep them safe in their work and how do we enable people to work into their late 60s or even in the future 70s? How do we look after women in the workplace? How do we support people who've got other health conditions to remain in work? What about if you wanted to come back to work after you've had major surgery, like a heart lung transplant or hip and knee replacement? How do we prevent harm to workers in construction? How do we promote healthy work? What are the climate effects on the health of workers? And we have a whole host of different worker cohorts. 
So the course is structured so that there are introductory epidemiology and introductory biostats, which everybody does. And then there are a series of uh, options in terms of uh, um, psychosocial work environment, chemical and biological hazards, introduction to occupational health and safety, and safety management systems, as well as environmental influences on health, assessment and control of workplace hazards, and a, new, uh, and a newly named unit called Humans Work and Physical Hazards. There are also the opportunities to do the full masters by taking up some electives in research methods and injury epidemiology and prevention. So if you did this course, what would you do afterwards? Well, certainly it's a key route to becoming a safety professional in industry or to go into something like the Environmental Protection Agency. Obviously, a number of our colleagues who come to us are already healthcare professionals and it enables them to move into strategic roles in occupational health, nurses, doctors or other kinds of professionals. There are a range of policy opportunities from this type of education as well in the health department and in other federal government departments but also there are real opportunities to do research or to become an educator in your own right. So we are at the present developing the courses further. In particular, we're looking to work more closely with colleagues who deal with illness and injury in the Healthy Working Lives group, and we're making it possible for you to move between their courses and ours. That will give you an opportunity to better understand how workers' compensation schemes work. And we constantly have to update these courses. If you think about the pictures I showed at the beginning, the world of work is on the flux all the time. So it's really important that we're constantly thinking of the harms to health through more modern types of work and making sure that our course provides for those needs. So I'd love to take the opportunity to introduce Louise and see if she could give you her a few minutes of her insights. Okay. Um, so, well, I'm um, been a GP, I think this is 27 years. Um, and uh, in the beginning, um, in general practice, when I did, um, you know, the earlier years, um, and some rural practice, we really um, had time to do our house calls and engage with our patients and know a lot about the work that they did. And as time goes on, a lot of a GP's core role is um, injury management, and also working with people who are I've worked with people who are long-term unemployed or on disability pensions. Um, why did I come to do the course? Well, I did a clinical certificate in um, occupational medicine in 2017, which was while I was working in part-time occupational medicine roles. And finally, I got a chance to start this course. Um, I'm really enjoying it. Um, I'm enjoying the online aspect and I'm enjoying block days. Um, the material that I learn um, in, in my study at night or from other colleagues or from our online chats which are engaging is something that I take back into my work every day. Um, I'm now, and it's not that I don't like being a GP, I'm still keeping that open, um, but as I've got to this stage in my career and, and my family life, I'm now working exclusively in occupational medicine five days a week. Um, it's a, quite a big load I'm finding time-wise doing full-time work and then two units, but um, the units are so, so good and so valuable that they have actually become my leisure time. I do fit in other things, family time and exercise and you know, there's a good balance and, and semester doesn't go 26 weeks a year. There's plenty of time to rest in between. Um, I, I just find each night, you know, I might come home from work feeling a little bit tired. Um, but when I'm sort of hopping into my car on the way home, I think, now, what am I going to do in my study tonight? <laughs> what am I going to learn? You know, this weekend I've got a big assignment to do and I'm thinking, well, that's my creativity, that's my chance. And what a privilege is it that someone at the other end of this assignment will sit there and painstakingly read what I've done, think about it, reflect on it, and then give something back to me that will help my learning grow. And you know, this is now second semester for me, um, but the material that I learned first semester is still coming up and I, I find, oh, it pops up in my subconscious to my conscious when I'm driving, I think, oh, I understand that a little bit differently. So I think learning 
is is a continuous process and particularly the way that that this course is taught um, i also really enjoy doing the chemistry physics science again um, it's medicines and art and medicines a science but i must say most of my career up until now was heavily weighted to the art which is what naturally i i you know, it was my practice and I'm, I'm good at, but I'd forgotten just how much I liked chemistry. <laughs> so it's been good. And instead of doing house calls, I'm now going to, um, you know, I've done quite a few factory visits and um, had, had enough confidence to go, oh, I'm interested in the hospitality industry. So I've organised some visits um, to um, restaurants because I'm particularly interested in the health of chefs, kitchen hands, and and then more front of house but particularly the hard life of a um, commercial in commercial cookery i did an interesting project on health of nail technicians so i got to do what i was interested in for my project and someone who was learned and patient and experienced um, was there on the other end to guide me through it um, yeah so any questions anything else you might like to ask me karen <laughs> Thank you, Louise. That's brilliant. I think uh, it'd be really interesting if you could just reflect for a second. Obviously, you're a healthcare professional, as a number of people in the course are, but what that mingling of different kind of backgrounds does for the learning. Oh, it's fantastic. You know, it's mingling of, of different, um, not just our professional backgrounds, but age it's a, it's just that's one thing i put down a few ideas here and the first thing i put was that the whole environment's inclusive and welcoming everyone you know i, I actually went in there and you know so i'm a little bit older i have done a master's before in family medicine i have studied um before but i thought oh gosh what will it be like walking in here on the first day i want to do the study but will i you know do i really belong here <laughs> and the younger students were just so welcoming and all the cultural backgrounds, the efforts that people have made to come to Block Weeks um, and everybody was well and truly rewarded, I think, from attending Block Week. Um, no, I, th I think, you know, I like the course so much. I've been saying to one of my friends who did environmental engineering, oh, this is a great course. And, <laughs> and my brother's a physio. I'm saying, gee, that's a great course. You know, um, I'd recommend it to all specialties. And, and, you know, the way the teachers teach, if if you haven't done, like I, I did physics in medicine, but I didn't do any physics in high school. It's not a drama because you're applying the learning. Um, yeah, it's great. And there's a nice cafe and collegial atmosphere. And, you know, I'm pretty sure I'll keep up with some of the other um, people from my year as we go along. It's it's really nice. Thank you so much, Louise. Right. You're doing a great job. I'll pay you later. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Shu Yi. I think we're done. All right. Thanks, Karen and Louise. Um, if you could get the rest of the academics to switch on your cameras as well, we'll now take questions from the audience. All right, so um, the first question is mainly around the areas of health data analytics and biostatistics. If um, either of you could um, just briefly give, you know, like a brief comparison of the, the differences in terms of like career pathways and the types of subjects that you'll be studying. I know you briefly mentioned earlier, Andrew, but if you would like to elaborate a bit further. Yeah, I'll go through that again. I know there are some other questions that Joe mm. will handle. So I'll, I'll have first go at this and then you can come in after me, Joe. Look, the, these two courses are re very much related. So the Master by Statistics has got the long history of 20 years by and fully by distance. But there's def there was definitely need for a face-to-face -face option. The health data analytics being a longer course it covers more computational and programming aspects and um, sort of hand, it's essentially handing large data, handling large data aspects than the Master of Biostatistics does. The Master of Biostatistics is geared towards um, more of the process where you have to think about what data will be collected, um, process of collecting the data, making sure that the data is, um, is 
reliable, the measurements are reliable, and uh, and that the data collected can answer the research questions before you even get to the point of analyzing the data. The health data analytics is much more geared around um, career, uh, career options where there is an existing amount of health data and you want to basically make sense of that masses of data. And the health data analytics incorporates four units from the Faculty of Information Technology in there. Essentially, you'll be in the class with Master of Data Science students. So you get a, a greater background in a sort of the traditional data science, handling large data. Um, there are two subjects on programming in the health data analytics, whereas only one in the Master of Biostatistics. So it really does have the greater emphasis on um, dealing with sort of large amounts of data. The career paths, you could probably apply to similar positions, but I think someone working for um, maybe even a, uh, uh, say a private health insurance company where they've got um, just uh, claims records from years and years and years, thousands or even millions of cl claims records. And I wanna say, well, what are the characteristics of individuals who have large claims or whatever? then a health data analytics student would be better addressed to, to be able to handle sort of large data questions like that. But if the, if the job was about, oh, we want to design a new uh, health promotion program for, our, um, for the subscribers of our private health insurance, and we want to be able to evaluate that program, then a master of biostatistics would be um, provide you the, with the greater score skills to be able to do that. So it's really, um, there's so much overlapping, but they, they differ in the sort of the design of the data collection versus analyzing and making sense of large quantities of data. So Joe, would you like to add anything briefly to that? I know there are some other questions that will sort of overlap that. That's pretty right. I, I, I think um, the element is more uh, on, on data science, like you're talking about. In, the, in that area, there's coding and, and it's large data sets. So, um, you know, when, when you start manipulating existing big bigger data sets, uh, and, and, and that does span a lot of organisations nowadays. But, yeah, Andrew, you've covered it. I think, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thanks, Joe okay. and um, Andrew. Okay, um, the next question we've got, well, Joe, you have briefly answered it already. It's in regards to, are these courses better suited for industry? What would you recommend for someone who would prefer the career of an academic pathway? Uh, yeah, look, I did answer that. Um, it, it, it's not industry-oriented. Um, uh, there, you, you are quite... What I mean by that is that you can progress to a PhD and research and, um, you know, we're working in big data in, in academia and that's more and more happening. Um, it's just that you've also got that. <laughs> There's also an industry demand as well. Um, so you've got the, the world is your oyster. You can choose which way you want to go, whatever you feel like that you that drives you. I think that's probably the best way um, rather than, than saying, no, it's just industry or just academia. It mm. spans both. And I, by the way, I've come from industry and come back into academia. So I've actually rather the other way around. So, you know, you can move back and forth. Thanks, Joe. Um, Karen or Richard, have you got anything to add on to that? You're muted. <laughs> I, I, I should add something something to do. So um, there are quite a few positions in the tech industry um, looking at sort of uh, web usage, web traffic, and so many companies wanting to optimize their product to retain um, potential customers when they come to a website. And uh, one of the main new areas is called A-B testing in that. And so you see positions for person to do a b testing but that is just randomized clinical trials so with a master of biostatistics you'll be able to get an extremely high level position in a b testing because that's just not covered in the traditional data science 
area. So a lot of what's new is actually old, but getting rebadged. And so part of part of both courses is to really highlight the methods and techniques that have been around for a long time, but are getting rebadged with new names and to be able to sort of assist graduates in sort of marketing themselves as having skills in these new methods that are really just old methods. Mm, thanks, Andrew. And Karen, I noticed you're about to say something. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think probably the, the question I was more thinking about the data analytics uh, side of things, but I think all of our degrees sort of kind of create a, a, a skill set that you could turn in either direction. To be honest, I think that's one of the big advantages of all these offerings is that they're not differentiating you down just one pathway, you could actually really open up your opportunities. Yep, thank you. And Louise and Janine, if you've got anything to add onto that, for example, where your friends have gone on to work once they graduated, or if, you've, if you know of any colleagues who have gone on to different pathways. Um, uh, everyone, that all, all of my colleagues from the Master of Forensic Medicine have gone on to work in the area. Um, and a lot of them have um, sort of started the course and then, like myself, worked in the area and continued um, while working. So a lot of them are working in clinical forensic medicine um, in units in Melbourne or around the country or, or overseas. All right. Um, thanks, Jenny. Lewis. Yes. Um, well, the parts, the units that I'm doing are compulsory for occupational physician training. But, you know, as, as we said earlier, the course, the people in the course is a much broader group. So they're all doing interesting things. Um, and um, even if I wasn't doing occupational physician training, if I was being my same GP, um, I would really like this course because it being, um, it just Sometimes in the general practice, and I don't know about other professions, um, you can just stay in a room often on your own, whereas having a, access to the learning and the connections from a course like the one I'm in the middle of doing um, just gives that little bit of, it, it's just that opportunity to get beyond um, the immediate and connect with, um, you know, get out into the world a little bit more. And um, I think that's so good for health in general. Um, that's one of the themes anyway, where it's good for health, but um, so is learning. So, Thanks, Louis. Yeah. All right, um, the next question is for you, Joe. It's in regards to the, the health data analytics degree. So what portion of the course is delivered online as opposed to face-to-face? -face? So this is in regards to some students who are working full-time while doing the course part-time. Well, we, we've, we've had students uh, this year working uh, and doing the part-time, um, so it is possible. So now, uh, what portion is um, is face-to-face -face versus online? Is that the question? Um, yes. I think it was, yeah. Uh, look, it's uh, the first year. Um, it's uh, just having a look. It's probably... 50-50 and then the second year it depends on your electives on how you want to um you know select them I'm just having a look um and again you know uh, yeah it'll depend on your electives what you choose for the second year whether you choose some online or face-to-face -face, because obviously you might, if you want to specialize in um in uh, the faculty of IT often that's you go face-to-face -face with that um yeah Andrew, uh, did you want to put anything in on that as well? You're probably about 50-50. But it, it depends if, um, if you're an international student or not. So international students are limited in the number of online units you're allowed to take. So of course, I, yes. I think you'd have to do maybe 10 or 11 out of the 16 units would need to be sort of face-to-face -face units if, if you're yeah. an international student, but for a domestic student, um, depending on your electives, it could be, I think, maybe, maybe, maybe just be the three core biostatistics, it may be 13 out of the 16. But yeah, it, it depending yeah. if you choose your biostats. Or if you choose year. the biostatistics stream, yeah, then you may right. get <laughs> half, it could yeah, be half face-to-face, half, -face, half online. So it depends which, which sort of stream and which units, elective units to choose. All right, thanks, Andrew and Joe. 
Okay, the next question we'll be looking at is in regards to health data analytics yeah. again. <laughs> so <laughs> if a student does not have prior coding experience, yeah, so this would there be yeah. any issues? Like, is there anything a student can do to prepare such as online courses beforehand? Yeah, that's that's a really good question, actually, um, because... Uh, you know, straight out of the out of the blocks, we we wanted you to have at least some expertise in 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 foundation R, um, and if you don't, you can go and um, get just understanding R coding because from then on, it's Python's not too difficult once you get the idea of of doing R, um, and just before the first before the in the intro to health data analytics, we're going to be doing a like a, a pre seminar to help people kickstart them with the coding in that respect I mean of course it's better if you do have coding um, you should have some statistical back, uh, background um, and that would be advantageous all right thanks Joe and stay on the line <laughs> next question is for you as well could you talk a bit more about the research project or capstone project which is part of semester four yeah, I saw that they wanted to know whether you go out to industry externally. Um, it's internal. And so um, the one-on-one -on -one projects will be specific um, topics um, paired up um, with um, somebody within uh, our, our faculty. Um, and then the little, the small projects will be um, ones that we will have set um, for, the, for them to do a uh, project with some, some uh, big data. So yeah, thanks, that, Joe. That, and are you happy with that, Andrew? Because yeah, uh, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, I think another part of the question was in regards to you know which companies or institutes um could, could we expect to collaborate with when it comes to working on those research projects. Uh, well, that was that was ex that was assuming that it was being external, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, but some of the some data that we we work on, um, we work on depending on um, what you be doing, maybe work that uh, might be registry, some of our registry work or uh, data um, with a number of registries, and uh, might be working with you know there might be a project with um, forensic. Uh, um, well, students have the opportunity to choose um, which, you know, companies or institutes they kind of partner with for this project. Mm. Um, the 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 practical project, the one on one, not well. We probably offer we'll pair them up depending yep. on, after a discussion. All right, thanks, Joe. We don't want people to do something they don't like because then yep. they yep. won't enjoy it. It needs to be, um, yeah. Yep. All right. Perfect. Yeah. The next question is in regards to biostats and um, again, health data analytics. It's in regards to <laughs> Andrew. You can ask that one. Yeah. Um. If the student has got you know background in stats and maths, but do not have experience in bio or medical science, would they still be you know eligible and would they be ready to do a course in biostats or health data? Yes, so um, there's slightly separate answers for must and biostats and health data analytics. Both are absolutely yes, but for for different reasons. So with um, with the master of biostatistics, typically about half the students have come from a math stats background, and so they they find the uh, the mathematical work easier and the health applications um, more challenging. And then the other students come from a health background; they can understand the health applications of what they need to do, but they struggle more with their, not struggle more, they find the, the mathematical side more challenging. And the advantage of having both, um, both types of students is typically even in an online environment, students help each other out. And typically you have groups of students sort of working together, some with the maths and some with the health background. But one of the first units that students will uh, study in the Master of Biostatistics is the epidemiology unit, which Will give you a background in sort of epidemiological principles. The Master of Health Analytics goes actually further than that, and there's a whole unit on health and human body systems designed specifically for students who don't have any health background whatsoever. So both both can cater for it. Yes, absolutely. So it's not a concern whatsoever. 
Yeah, thanks, Andrew. And Joe, have you got anything to add on to that? No, that, that was that was perfect. Yeah, 